What's good, gamers? Good morning. Welcome to Rage Quit Video Game Talk Show. How you doing, Henrik the Wreck? Oh, as always, I'm doing amazing. How about yourself, Chris? Hey, everything's good. I had an amazing time over the weekend seeing the, the crazy Aussies called Parkway Drive. If you're a heavy metal fan like me, oh my gosh, that pyro show and, and the rotated drum kit just to see that drummer upside down. <laughs> So badass live, but man, I am, I'm stoked. I'm ready to rock and roll. And I see you look at you, Pikachu, and you try to catch them all. You styling and profiling right now. Okay. So where did you pick <laughs> up the inspiration? Were you trying to go for a certain video game character or what was going on? No, no, I just, you know, it's a typical haircut. I do, you know, zero on the sides and in the back and then just trim the front and I do it myself. So oh, I kind of get you, to you, dial it in the way I want. You sure you didn't use an AI filter? I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> as there is a little pun to that, as we're going to be talking about that later on Patch Notes. So stick around in the live show because we got so many things to discuss. But I always like to say this at the top of the show. Join us. Join the conversation. This is live. So if you guys want to be featured live on air and you want to have your voices heard, what do you do? Hit yourself inside the inside the chat box. Go inside there, join the conversation. We would love to hear from you. But we always like to set the tone. We always uh, search you for goofy content that's uh, circulating across the web. And I don't know if I've ever made this kind of mistake, Henrik, but, um, you know, someone sometimes, I guess, certain gamers, uh, have a hard time figuring out which is which. And have you purchased something online that you were like, holy cow, this is for the completely wrong game? Oh, I mean, probably. I, I usually am pretty careful, but uh, I, I probably have made some mistake like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, this one guy was uh, trying to one up as my player on NBA 2K24. And as you'll see in this video clip, things did not go as planned. Oh, you get 200K VC for $50? What? what a, that's 200K? Yeah, that, was, that was every year, my little. <laughs> Bad, bad, bad. Oh, you I got you. Get your bill to eighty-five with that too, bro. Bad, bad. Oh yeah, we live, we live, we live, we live, we live. Oh my god. Uh -huh. It got me wearing number forty-three on the fucking heat. Bro, y'all gotta be lying. Y'all gotta be lying, bro. Y'all gotta be lying, bro. Oh my! Oh my god! <laughs> Current wallet amount one dollar, bro. No, no that's so funny man when i saw that i was like i i had a lot of the same feeling as some of the uh comments that were uh, circulating across the globe like the first person put here uh quote stop clip farming end quote the chat understands and i didn't quite understand what clip farming was so Clearly, the chat didn't understand, but what clip farming means for anybody that has no idea, uh, they're doing this for clout. They, this is fake. He has the money. He's just hoping that it was circulating across the globe. I'm hoping he's a dumbass because that was really funny. Uh, second one was, this is why I stall when buying anything online and just scan every word to make sure I don't F up like this. Kind of wild how virtual coins doesn't transfer over. It's 2K's currency. Your balance should carry over. They shouldn't be allowed to sell virtual coins for out-of-season games. I think that's a, a good point, but the thing is that you have to understand about 2K, they want you to spend two grand out of your parents' savings so then you can compete in my player uh so do you always kind of read the fine print or are you just kind of locking and loading oh no i i definitely do because uh if i'm spending some money on a skin or something usually it's like 20 dollars or something nowadays and i want to make sure that 20 dollars goes to where i want it to go and not somewhere that i don't want it to go yeah i mean that, that is one of the more crazy unfortunate uh, cases if that is true but hey you the yeah. gamers you dispel it i mean is it real is it fake let us know what's good but what i know is not fake is it seems like everybody in the year 2023 is suffering what i've been feeling it seems like this is like a reoccurring thing every two weeks now henrik where everybody's noticing that their playstation 4 consoles are completely going kapoop they all sound like jet engines, and here is just another dose of reality for a lot of us Sony fans like myself who still clutch onto our PS4 because it's great for the kids when they come over, and you know you can you know put them on that cloud gaming and etc. But check out what's going on with this life support. <laughs> so 
So Henrik, <laughs> first reaction. What do you say about that? Just let it go. Good night, sweet prince. Your time is up. <laughs> you did a good job. You lasted, but maybe it's time to just roll into the sunset. <laughs> hey, well, I mean, at least you're saying moving on. A lot of cats just felt like they needed to let the kid know that there's a certain way to do it. Like, wow, almost as if he shouldn't be running in a drawer. <laughs> I mean, true, true. Some people will probably do 20 things before trying to open it up to clean or reapply a heat sink. I'm telling you right now, brother, everybody has tried this with the PlayStation 4. It just sounds like that, okay? And last, take it out of the drawer. No air circulation. That's a good point, but overall, it's going to make that deathly sound. You're never going to get rid of it. It's over 10 plus old, you know. But yeah, I mean, I get it. Some people don't want to pay, pay, you know, 550 bucks for a new console or sure as hell don't want to pay $1,500 for a PC. So, you know, we're going to live with what we got, you know, until the smart TVs can start figuring out and we can start streaming games. <laughs> 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 but this clip has definitely been going viral for a couple of weeks. We haven't been able to showcase it to our fans, but if you haven't seen it, this is going to be like the most friendly funniest prank that you could pull on your relatives i would prefer to do it on your mom and dad the next time you're in a drive through but go ahead and check this out because this is so freaking funny wait, oh, wait, the, also, wait, wait, the uh the Hold. fortnite battle pass the what fortnite battle pass can i get the fortnite battle pass i'm sorry honey could you add the fortnite battle pass to that ma'am we don't have a <laughs> I like how there's a guy on the other end that had to help even for the female employee inside going, wait, what? I just work at Taco Bell making like minimum wage. <laughs> like what the heck is a Fortnite battle pass? Yeah, they were all confused, but that's just such a great harmless prank because, uh, you know, you're just playing on the fact that your mom doesn't know what a Fortnite battle pass is. Exactly. <laughs> and so people were having a lot of fun. They love this video. And one person wrote, you know, that dude was dying before, uh, quote, Ma, we don't got the battle pass, end quote. <laughs> <laughs> nah, bro, I'd be cringing as F once I seen who drove up to my damn window. Okay, but we never saw who they look like except the mom, so okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I laughed way too hard at this, and yeah, you ain't lying, man. That is uh, a golden gem. It almost makes me feel like I got to pull it off on my parents pretty soon, but I haven't been in the drive-thru <laughs> with them recently. So, Ma, you want to buy me some food? <laughs> <laughs> but hey, you know, I got to show this. We usually only show like three viral content stuff, but this was uh, too good to not showcase. So, like most NFL players, um, NFL running back, for the New York Jets, Brees Hall uh, loves playing some Madden. But there are some repercussions when you do that because it appears the game has also turned into an avenue for fans to reach out and bash him through the gaming oh. DMs. I mean, they're texting you now through the PS5? I mean, that is so freaking hilarious. And then one person wrote, I had a guy break up with me over Xbox chat. <laughs> That's rough. That's, That's brutal. real rough. <laughs> Jets need to sign me. I'll win the World Series for the first ever Stanley Cup. I see what you're doing there. And <laughs> last, GG. Easy, pal. I'm sick. <laughs> I mean, Brees Hall did get the last laugh as much as maybe that fuel put the fuel to the fire because they ended up playing the Denver Broncos. And if you follow the NFL, you know, they were uh, essentially uh, hoping that they could support their offensive court uh, coordinator, Nathaniel Hackett, because he used to be the coach for the Denver Broncos. So that was kind of a cool moment to kind of see them clap back but for everybody that's joining us while you're already here you might as well hit the like and subscribe button so you never miss a live show and i will encourage you to join us uh join the chat uh comment live and your voice will be heard you'll be featured live on air but hey henrik are you ready to rock and roll Oh, you know I am, and I know exactly what time it is. It's time to rage. Hey, it's time to rage, fam. Let's get it. Hey everyone, this is Pause or Repeat. Here we figure out whether a game is really worth your time and money. Today's game is Counter-Strike 2. Counter-Strike 2 just recently launched to replace Counter-Strike Global Offensive, but is it a sequel or just a big update? Let's take a look at Valve's iconic shooter by first looking at the gameplay. 
The gameplay of Counter-Strike 2 is much the same as any of the previous Counter-Strike games. It is a tactical shooter where peeking corners and game sense reigns supreme. This means that the game's pace is going to be much slower than many shooters out there today, such as Call of Duty. That being said, each gun has a specific skill curve to learn how to best use it. From learning to aim precisely and quickly with a sniper, to learning the spray patterns for guns like the AK-47, there is a plenty high skill ceiling to keep yourself busy. Gameplay outside of this largely consists of queuing up at the game's provided game modes, but the classic one being terrorists versus counter-terrorists, where the terrorists have to plant a bomb. This mode has a casual and a ranked mode for you competitive gamers out there. Which leads us to the story. The story of Counter-Strike 2 is entirely told from context and is not really a big focus at all. The only thing you really need to know about the story is the whole terrorist versus counter-terrorist team separation, and even that is entirely just a gameplay mechanic. Even then, most people will probably completely forget about the contextual story, as the gameplay is definitely the focus here. Overall, Counter-Strike 2 is a sequel that so far the community is optimistic about, but does wholly seem like just a huge update, but it has brought up the conversation behind live service games updating and leaving previous versions behind to be lost to time, particularly because you are now unable to go back and play Counter-Strike Global Offensive as this update has replaced it. But now the question still stands. Pause or repeat? This one's an interesting one for us to do because we normally do games that are, you know, a little bit more story based. And that's why the segment for the story is kind of like, what story? What there story? Is not really, <laughs> there, there really isn't a story when it comes to this game. But at the same time, you know, it's it's an iconic series that's been around for a long time. Two and decades! When I, exactly, yeah, two decades. It's, it's crazy how long it's been around. I always forget about that, actually. But when I tried playing this, uh, you know, disclaimer, it's been, you know, probably close to 20 years since I've played Counter-Strike because uh, the last time I played Counter-Strike really consistently was during the Counter-Strike Source time, which mm. that game came out in 2004. So right. yeah, that's a long time ago. Um, and, you know, I probably was not good back then. No, you were playing I, on your Windows XP. You're in elementary school. Yeah, exactly. You know, like the the family <laughs> computer that you know. Yeah, is you just probably there, put not a really virus a on computer. You know, yeah, you yeah, turned exactly. into LimeWire too. <laughs> <laughs> good times, good times. You know, golden era of gaming back then, at least in my head. Um, but yeah, it, it it just felt like maybe for me, uh, the gameplay felt really slow, and and maybe that's just me expecting. Uh, when I go into a shooter nowadays, I'm going for the shooters uh, like ones that we've mentioned already on the show, like uh, um, Turbo Overkill, where it's super fast paced, uh, super uh, uh, action packed. And this one, by comparison, is just a lot slower. And you know, you got to take your time. You got to be a little bit methodical with everything. And I don't know. It was just, it was just jarring to me to. Well, cause jump you're from... locked into that kind of like, you know, first person mode where you're playing Halo. I mean, why can't we aim yeah. down the barrel of the gun? I mean, you would have thought it in a 2.0, we would start to move on and start looking like Call of Duty or Battlefield or the new Ubisoft uh, X Deviant. And it's like, really? Like, this is what we got because people keep questioning this game, Henrik. I'm curious on what you think because people, is this really like the next evolution of this long standing? Free to play game? Like, will this really hold up? I mean, people have been saying for the longest time Fortnite would fall out. I kind of have a feeling Counter Strike would do that way before Fortnite ever goes away. Well, at the same time, though, uh, there's a big esports scene for Counter Strike, and the community is still Very really point. active. So, I, I mean, I see what you're saying because you would expect that they would have innovated between, you know, Counter Strike Global Offensive and Counter Strike 2. But I think at the same time, if they do add in features like aim down sights and things like that, they're going to get huge backlash from the people who've been playing Counter-Strike all the way since the 1.6 days or even, you know, uh, back when the game wasn't even an official release. It was just a mod of Half-Life. So yeah. I think that, you know, they, they're kind of in that position where they can't really change too much because if they do, they're going to lose their identity. 
And uh, I, I don't think- know. I think I would challenge you on that just a little bit. I think it's more really? of a Val's decision to uh, kind of hold on to, you know, steam inventories that players have held on to for the last two decades. Because the thing is, when you have real world value when it comes to digital assets, you know, like people always opening up those, you know, crates to unlock knives or gun skins. I think that's really what they're clutching on to because uh, my honest opinion, it just doesn't feel like the gameplay has been advanced. Zero. I mean, it doesn't make me want to stick around long enough. Well, that's the thing. Yeah, like the, the gameplay hasn't changed, but I do agree that I will. You know, OK, so then, you know, not changing the backbone of uh, their monetization through the caches is a great move by them because if they had moved on from that, I'm sure they get crazy backlash because probably want to get the fan uh, base to follow. Right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Cause some of these uh, like knife skins and things like that are like hundreds of dollars. Imagine you buy a skin in your, one of your favorite games. Uh, we'll say Fortnite, for example, and then all of a sudden an update comes out and you have no access to that skin that you bought for $500. Right, that like Unreal be, Engine 6 comes out, and they're like, sorry, we downloaded a whole new yeah. app, we're revamping it. <laughs> yeah, be crazy. I, I mean, I don't know about some of you guys, but I would be livid if that was the case. <laughs> oh, absolutely. But I thought you brought up an excellent point talking about Counter-Strike's impact on esports world, because just in August 2023, 37,000 fans showed up in Germany to watch the sold-out final of the Intel Extreme Masters. But is that enough to continue to keep people motivated? I know that there was millions more watching online, which is really incredible, but I'm thinking about the long run, not the short run. And I see this transition with Counter-Strike and, you know, developing, you know, maps like Inferno to have a little bit more sharpened detail to the map. But then you see maps like Cash, who seem like they're absent of any kind of change whatsoever so when i see this and i know that they're running on a new engine called source engine 2 whoop de doo no one really cares the gamers out there we just want a really badass game and it's unfortunate because this game sets up the best kind of competitive play that everybody wants in online gaming so i would like to see this series become successful but i think there's just Way too many shooter games out there, and this is not something that I would be uh, pushing forward with, I think, all the way till the end of the year. I think it dies pretty much by Thanksgiving. I mean, we'll see, though, because, uh, you know, bringing up, again, the eSports thing, you see eSports uh, sections of other games die so much nowadays, and the fact that the eSports scene is still active for this series... That says something that says that there are people who are willing to not only play and compete, but also people who are willing to watch and, uh, you know, give their time and their money towards this uh, uh, growing industry of esports for this this uh, game series. Yeah, I, I think, think that's that a good something. point, too. But like, obviously, we've talked about with the IOC and the Olympics about how they don't want shooter games because, you know, well, obviously it's a global event. You know, we don't want to promote, <laughs> you know, warm and crime and shooting counterterrorism, terrorism. Who, who is it? Which is which? Right. Uh, but then again, we got the Asian games that just went on recently, uh, which we've come to find out and discover that almost half of the games, probably almost two third of the games are from once uh a single studio company. So that's kind of the tough battle. I mean, it, you know, maybe Counter-Strike has to continue to do their own thing to become relevant, kind of like what Fortnite was implementing. I know they were showcasing their brand new fancy trophy, trying to entice people to um, be encouraged to join their $4 million tournament. So, hey, I mean, I guess we'll see what's good. But to be honest with the fam, I think everybody's hearing it in my voice and tonality. I'm not hyped on this game at all. I, I, it's a definite pause for me. Yeah, I believe it's a pause for me as well, considering uh, I, I just don't see myself playing this very much. I mean, maybe I'll hop on every now and then just to see what's going on and see if the because game is free still to play. Alive. But because, would yeah, you pay for the fifteen dollars to do what everybody else is doing, like the streamers XQC and them, to be like, "Oh my gosh, I got the new knife!" Like, 
I still don't understand the hype. I mean, we're, we're talking about, you know, physical copies, how they're dying, how that could be worth some money. At least you can touch that compared to this. It's a digital asset. What's stopping somebody from just, you know, mimicking it or jailbreaking this game to the point where you can get that weapon, skin, or knife? So I, I just think that fat is so stupid and lame. And if you're that kind of person that gets all excited for it, cool, whatever, whatever floats your boat. But it ain't for me, fam. Yeah, I mean, the, the knife skins and gun skins are all really cool. I, I can say that, but it doesn't entice me to go and play a game that I'm not having actual fun playing, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Big time. But hey, let us know what's good. Join the conversation. And man, gamers, we are only getting started. This is Rage Quit Video Game Talk Show. And that's my boy, Henrik the Wreck. And stick around because we got so much more left here live on the show fam so you ready to rock and roll henrik the wreck absolutely let's rage what's good gamers welcome to patch notes where my co-host henrik the wreck and i discuss gaming news industry talk and so much more so let's get it and if you haven't already seen this newest Corridor digital video going around, well, there is a popular CG tech enthusiast that are no stranger to controversy, but it's latest video where they use AI to, quote, fix the faces in video games, end quote, has really got artists and gamers ticked off. Uh, that's being real nice about it. We've discovered a new tool in the VFX world that when combined with video games could revolutionize how characters are rendered. Ooh. Wow, that looks great. Imagine your favorite character, but as a real person with a photorealistic face. Oh my God. Oh. Finally. What we are going to show you is, in my opinion, the future of video game graphics. There is a new piece of technology called Insight Face from the company Pixie AI. And if you provide it a single image of a face, it can morph that face onto another character. Using this process, we can turn video game characters into real people. Not just an actor that looks like the character, but an actual true-to-life rendering of what that character might look like. And I'm not lying, like, there was so many people wanting to express their thoughts, their frustration. Everybody wants to have their voices heard on social media, right, Henry? So, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, as you can look as we show these comments, you're going to see a lot of the, the, the thumbs up on a lot of these comments because people all express the same feeling. First comment that we got here is, it's hilarious how much worse they're making these faces while gushing about how amazing they look. I would describe any of these results as, quote, photo reel, end quote. They're all giving Photoshop beauty filter homogeny. There's this incredible level of detail on the original model of Aloy to the point where you can see the faint hair growing on her face. If you zoom in close enough, imagine how smooth and plastic her skin would be if you used this method. Two points. Number one, even if face is 10 out of 10, body and facial animations can still make uncanny. Number two, style over realism. I look at Nathan, Laura, and Aloy. Uh, in my opinion, the improved faces have less character. Now I'm starting to appreciate more of the work of game developers who give their characters unique and memorable features that the human face does not have. And last, the problem is if you upgrade the textures or models without changing the animations, it just looks cursed. And uh, by combining the AI face morphing tech, called Inside Face with the popular AI image generator, Stable Diffusion XL, they could, quote, revolutionize how video game characters are rendered by initialized or essentially grafting an AI-generated filter across a character model's face so it looks more photorealistic. So I want to bring Henrik the Wreck in. I know he was extremely frustrated about this situation. You're not really showing it on your face right now. Why aren't you showing it? Are you just trying to mimic the beauty filter on screen? What the hell's going on? <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, it was wild to me that they even thought that these were improvements because they're 100% not. You're just <laughs> stripping away all the character that these developers and artists decided to put into uh, these characters' faces. You're stripping that all away, giving them this like thousand yard stare where they're just staring into the abyss, <laughs> looking at almost nothing. And then now you're saying, oh, it's so much better. No, it's not. You just you destroyed it. 
I think <laughs> some people destroyed it. I think some people like yourself, though, are being a little bit harsh because I know we didn't have all the time in the world to play the whole 17 minute video, but they were having games that were like from the PS1 that they were putting this new technology on. You're going, okay, cool. That's kind of interesting to see that they did something different compared to some of these remastered games that are clearly haven't changed at all. They're just like, hey, look, you know, integrated with the new consoles. Whoop de doo! Because guess what? Cloud gaming's coming pretty soon, and everything's gonna be integrated. So figure it out, fam. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's true. You know, if you if you take these AI filters and put it on a really old game, it's gonna look like an improvement. But at the same time, like one of those commenters said, if you're not updating the animations to go with this new face, it just looks cursed. And I agree, it does <laughs> look cursed. It looks that there's a a. a Filter they put on Cloud from the Final Fantasy VII uh, remake, for example. Yeah. He looks so terrible. Like, my gosh. Like, he doesn't even look like he belongs in that game. He looks like he's just floating around. What am I doing here? Am I supposed <laughs> to yeah, be yeah, here? Yeah. Like, come on. Yeah, no, no, not much of anything. But, I mean, you know, we did see a little bit of an image of Starfield. I mean, that was one of the more newer games. I saw that. I thought that wasn't totally horrible i mean at the same time though bethesda's face uh um oh don't you go there oh don't you go there they spent a lot of time on that game (laughs) hold on hold on (laughs) i was gonna say bethesda's face designs have that like grit to them you know they're they're not perfect this filter just kind of tries to make it look perfect and that that you know takes away the charm i'd say you know, I think that's a good point that you're bringing up because last week we were talking about Unreal Engine 5 and what it has done for a lot of creators in the scope of the gaming industry, especially the indie developers. But we also referenced how not a lot of indie developers are embracing photorealism. Uh, is it because, you know, sometimes when things are not perfect, that's what makes a good game? Is that kind of what you're suggesting? When you go a little too photorealistic, does it pull you away? Well, it's just the whole debate of like, is photorealism really necessary? Sure. It's nice to look at a game and be like, wow, this looks amazing. Like I kind of can struggle with some games, uh, out there. Like there was that, uh, footage of Forza Motorsport, the new one. Oh yeah. That clip was awesome. Yeah. It looks like it's actual footage from the, uh, a camera mounted to the hood of a car. Right. Awesome. But is that also really necessary when really when it comes down to it, the gameplay is what makes you come back to the game, not necessarily the aesthetic. But like when you see this kind of technology that this crew is messing around with and then you hear, for example, that there's rumors of Fallout 4 getting a remastered and we all know is it was a beautiful game when it first came out, but the graphics seem a bit outdated for most gamers in the year 2023. Don't you think some of this AI filtered technology, you know, over time will start to get a little bit better? Don't you think it would enhance the gaming experience just a just a little bit? But you make a good point there that I'm going to counter you on where, you know, sure, the, the photorealism of remakes or, you know, when they try to do photorealism looks great now. But give it five, ten years, it's going to age maybe a little bit poorly. <laughs> I see where you're going with it. Yeah, you, you know. You know, when you stylize something, there's no uh, uh, aging factor there in the same way. So that's just. Well, a thing it doesn't to think seem about like uh, Donald Trump ages either. I mean, didn't you see his record? <laughs> He says we got a too old of a president. I know we're not politics. It's just hey, well, you know what? This some guy's three years younger than Joe Biden, always talking about age. <laughs> I mean, some people think there's reptiles in our government, so that's <laughs> one thing to say as well. <laughs> very, very true. But hey, you know, this is, you know, I still like seeing amazing technology like this. I'm a I'm a big AI guy. I think this is really cool. So, you know, the closer that we can get to having these tools available for developers and graphic artists, I think that's a uh, an amazing thing, an amazing, amazing thing. But hey, let's start to uh, transition a little bit. Uh, Henrik, what's going on in the world of Elon Musk? Oh, well, you know, Elon Musk is just doing his thing. You know, he kind of tries to put himself in headlines every week, it seems like. And uh, so everyone knows he owns Twitter and uh, it's now called X. Uh, 
many people in a video that I made uh, were quick to <laughs> dismiss me calling it X. They, they're they probably going to dismiss you now because you started off the conversation saying X. D true, true. I mean, even today, I've, I've gotten comments on that video saying, it's not X, it's Twitter, man. And I'm like, I... On my phone, I have it as Twitter. I don't call it X. Right. I call it X in the video because that's what it actually is called. But anyways, <laughs> regardless. Um, so he, he's been trying to make uh, you know X this everything app. And uh, recently, he just decided to try testing out video game streaming on the platform. Yeah. And we, we do have a, a bit of a clip. Th this is really just a test. So... Um... And it's, it's currently way too hard to do this. It's like, it took like hours to set this this up. So we need to make it just effortless. Uh, the user interface is uh, kind of complicated. Uh, we want to make it easy. Uh, but you can use OBS. So if you're using OBS already, uh, you can attach to access the stream. Oh my god. <laughs> I just got fragged by a blood blister. I think that's what everybody was looking forward to, seeing Elon Musk fail at playing video games. <laughs> <laughs> to Diablo 4. Uh, we might as well uh, showcase the comments before Henrik the Wreck and I chime in. Uh, the first comment that we got here on Twitter is Elon, a.k.a. CyberGamer420. By the way, that is the... Twitter user handle that he was using as he was video game streaming, which is funny because didn't he just acquire at gamer literally stole it from a user True. back when Jack Dorsey was around and he decides to stream on a cyber gamer 420 lame, but obviously Elon <laughs> thought it was funny that someone referenced it and he plays as monkey balls Four. that is his gamer tag. This is next level psycho and yeah you know he ain't lying uh number two by twitch nice knowing you still some ways to go to integrate obs and x but the potential is there surely x can do much better than help themselves to 50 percent of streamers subs add gaming section in the sidebar so people easily can find who streams gaming right now excellent point can't tap and hold to skip forward yeah that's frustrating if you're gonna be streaming for like two to three hours and you gotta watch from the beginning and uh, Elon Musk couldn't get the thing going for like the first 15. So yeah, you're going to essentially bail out if they can't fix that ASAP. Super sick. Streaming is going to be awesome. It may even replace spaces. Please do. Spaces is the lamest thing ever. <laughs> yeah. And last, right? <laughs> and Twitch and Kick, better watch out. X is here. Should Twitch and Kick be concerned, Henrik the Wreck? As it is right now, I don't think so because... Who out of any creator that any of our viewers know is actually excited to stream on X or Twitter or whatever? I mean, we streamed <laughs> the show on technically on X, but yeah, no, I get the point that you're trying to say. <laughs> but like, yeah, when you think of a video game stream or even just like a just chatting stream, you think of, you know, Twitch and YouTube and maybe Kick. Kick's like the up and comer and that, you know? But really, right. when it comes down to it, the communities are focused on Twitch and YouTube. And even then, Twitch is a different community than YouTube is. So maybe there'll be a different community on the the Twitter side of things, but it has to kick off first. You know, it has to be accessible for people. They have to be able to find it. They have to be able to see their creators on there. And I actually have a draw to go to it rather than, yeah, it's just the new uh, platform. Come see it. But I think that is promising, though. I mean, if they do add a gaming tab, I mean, people laughed at the fact that Facebook was trying to, you know, bring gaming to their platform. And I hate to break but it to you, Henry, but YouTube Gaming had uh, uh, closed their project and Facebook still has it. So there's obviously some sort of success bringing streaming video games two platforms and so if they can shake things up i think that's kind of cool but i think the problem is uh there's no incentive to really want to go to twitter you know there's no real way to figure out whether you're going to be paid on let's say elon's still hyped on crypto well how are they going to integrate that how are you going to get paid for streams can they show viewer counts can you uh show the chat up on screen uh we're technically on a service called restream.io so we could be video game streaming right now. We don't need OBS and stuff like that to be able to get going. 
What Elon is also saying is it's like, no, we don't have that quite there yet. And we also were trying to, you know, like the lower third says, we're aiming to kind of clean up some audio sounds, a little bit of a flickering that's going on with the video quality. But I don't know if they're going to be necessarily able to turn this around. I don't know if you saw in the news last week, Elon Musk was uh, visiting the border uh, towards Mexico and he was trying to do a, you know, a stream and it kept getting erupted. (laughs) <laughs> and yeah. like I it cut out after like four minutes or do people remember when uh, Elon Musk was so excited to bring a uh, Ron DeSantis, you know, the Florida governor into Twitter spaces. And he's like, we're going to have the first, you know, introduction. He's going to introduce his candidacy, you know, with us. And it completely failed. Like nobody can hear. They were toggling with the systems and they even come to find out that even with the situation over at the border in Mexico, There are reports from the New York Times reporter, Ryan Mack, that Elon Musk reached out to everyone. He sent a company-wide email saying, please fix this. What is going on? I need to get this stream going. So if I'm in in the move and I want to be, you know, a live reporter, this cannot happen. So with that being said, I mean, is this, are we going to see this anytime soon? Or is this going to take like a couple of years? I mean, yeah, there's a lot of tech that goes on behind the scenes to make live streaming work seamlessly and smoothly, and it'd be a good experience for the viewers. So maybe next year, maybe not this year, but maybe next year, they'll get things uh, really rolling to the point that people are going to want to actually go look at things on Twitter in the first place. But I don't see it happening this year. And, you know, that's considering we only have a couple months left in the in the year. So true. I mean, yeah, I think that's probably the better ballpark. Probably towards the end of the year, twenty twenty four, they'll maybe start to implement a system where you can actually get rewarded for your video game streaming content. I know Elon Musk has been trying to encourage, uh, you know, hosts like they got Tucker Carlson to leave Fox News to bring his show to Twitter. I know Elon has expressed to late night hosts like Bill Maher, for example, to bring his show to their platform, but that was during the Writers Guild of America strike. So now that that's over, he ain't going to do that, fam. But I mean, separately, the social media platform X is also going to be implementing a live shopping feature. And their first partnership is going to be with Paris Hilton. So, you know, the everything app is trying to embrace what I I guess TikTok has been doing. (laughs) Instagram has been doing. I mean, it just seems like he's just throwing everything at the wall and seeing what sticks, you know, and if it doesn't stick, toss it out. Hey, hence the quote unquote, everything app. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So he really, uh, you know, until it changes into the Apple wallet or X wallet, uh, I think we're all safe for now. (laughs) I think we can all have some fun in the Twitter verse, but Hey, um, do you have anything else you wanted to add to the conversation, Henrik? I think everything's been said at this point, so we should probably move on to the next topic, which uh, tell tell me what's going on with the Air Force. How is that related to our gaming show? Yeah, it seems like there's been a lot of updates recently when it comes to the military, the Navy, and the Air Force. Uh, We've reported just in Season 3 of Rage Quit Video Game Talk Show how they are using simulation to um, better train soldiers because Things get costly, especially when you're trying to train pilots to, you know, fly this very expensive gear. Gasoline isn't cheap. I mean, I was down the street. It was 550 in my area. So could you imagine how much it costs for a jet (laughs) to fuel every time you go up and down is totally insane. So digital training for soldiers, including playing video games, has been a part of military training Four years. I mean, Nintendo first got involved back in uh, the late 1980s or yeah, the late 1980s. And for former U.S. Air Force pilot Dan Robinson and his company Red Six are creating a military training metaverse that will be a paradigm shift for aerial combat forces. And it's really fascinating to hear from this gentleman. I want you guys to all check this out because, hey, you know, technology has gone a long way because of video games. Dan Robinson is a graduate of the UK Fighter Weapons School, the equivalent of the Navy's top gun. If it's got wings, he can fly. First time the tech crackled into life and we saw something in the sky, that's when we knew. 
And, uh, but this and was possible. That, that, that this was possible. The, the question was, could we do it in the air? That's pretty sinister looking up. It's really important to recognize where innovation is coming from. It is coming from these smaller startups and smaller companies outside of DoD. And we need a culture in DoD that can accept that, reflect what is happening outside, and embrace technology. We quickly identified in, in this journey that this has huge utility for training. Exactly. But critically, it has absolute utility for the warfighter, the ability to shorten the kill chain, right. the ability to save lives. Right. Uh, and so, outside the remit of the tests we're doing for the Air Force right now, we're simultaneously working on some very interesting uh, applications for warfighting. It's amazing technology that, uh, you know, Dan Robinson and his company, Red Six, have been working on. And the comments, you know, people obviously are a bit skeptical because it is the year 2023. And one person wrote, the future of military training sounds like something straight out of science fiction. I know. I hear you, fam. It's like what uh, Henrik was saying about graphics. It's like every five or ten years, everything's going to always seem like, oh, no, the science fiction is coming back at us again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they should have an AI Congress, Senate and Executive Branch, so they can be totalitarians in a fantasy instead of real life. Okay, fam. <laughs> <laughs> this kind of thing has been around for a while. It's a helpful place to start, but nothing is better than an actual flight hours and live combat training. Even that only gets a pilot so far. Back when computer-based simulated combat training began, the Department of Defense and the USAF got the harebrained idea that they could cut flight hours for training to save a buck. Didn't work then and will not work now. Simulation is a tool in the box, not a replacement for real training. For some reason, our military and many corporations never learn this lesson until it becomes costly. Okay. Uh, but people will make different in the moment decisions when their lives aren't at stake. Not if we go to remote controlled options. Then it's just like a video game to the controller. When the controller is done killing, after they're sorta, then they code the jet to land itself, log out, go eat tacos, and that's where we're heading. <laughs> and last, the eventual outcome of all this will be a war fought remotely by drones, robots, and AI. When a country loses all its weapons in this real video game, it gets conquered. Uh-oh, Terminator coming. But the Air Force has faced delays in getting pilots, you know, training for years now. And according to the Air and Space Forces magazine, with more than 900 airmen awaiting entry just for training. So you saw in the quick clip, they were putting on the VR headset. They were able to utilize that while they're up in the air. I know Dan Robinson is hoping that they can bring some of that simulation down on the ground. Uh, will this cut the cost on time and money, Henrik the Wreck? I mean, I'm sure it will because they, you know, can train people with the simulation first rather than having them up in the air using precious fuel and uh, yeah. time from people who need to be actually monitoring the airspace and people training those people up in the air as well, uh, flying probably alongside them, actually. Uh, so all in all, it really is a cost cutting measure. But at the same time, it's not necessarily a cost-cutting measure that will completely eliminate any training potential because, you know, we see it all the time for all sorts of industries, uh, including things like truck drivers and bus drivers, where they'll, they'll sit in a, a simulation first uh, where they're going to be driving whatever vehicle they're going to be driving, and then that simulation is supposed to at least simulate uh, emergency situations and just normal everyday situations you'll get into when driving these vehicles. So I think it'll be a thing that uh, they'll probably invest more into, if anything. Yeah, I mean, we got bus simulator, we got farm simulator, we got lawn mowing simulator. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty wild. I mean, Mud Runner, has anybody ever played that iconic game? I mean, it feels pretty freaking real when you're playing on a joystick, but then when you get the luxury to play it on, on the really cool steering wheels, man, it, it, it definitely feels like you're in that massive rig, but you nailed it. I mean, you know, with time and money, when it comes to the cost to even train pilots, they say it can range from nearly $6 million to over $10 million. And the Air Force, for example, spends over 
$33,000 an hour to operate an F-22 flight, $28,000 for an F-35, and $8,000 for an F-16. According to the Department of Defense data, it is out there. So when you see that and you can realize that there's over 900 men and women that want to be a part of the Air Force but don't have the opportunity because they're still waiting in line to get that training, why not embrace simulation and bring augmented to reality on the ground so then they can weed out who can actually do this? Because this is not an easy gig. I mean, come on now. Like, even in the video, like they said, this is top gun. I mean, this guy yeah. is no joke. So <laughs> if, if I'm going to trust anybody, I'm going to be trusting Dan Robinson and his company to bring this reality to life. And what, like we discussed uh, during season three, this isn't anything new with video games being embraced by the U.S. military because they partnered up with the nonprofit national security company to host esports tournaments on military installations. So, yeah, I mean, this could definitely be something that you will see more and more in the future. You know what? I wouldn't be surprised. Speaking of Top Gun, I wouldn't be surprised if Tom Cruise has a simulation rig in <laughs> some house somewhere to just sit in and, you know, not have to go up in the air and do anything. <laughs> you know, that, that was actually, uh, I don't know. That would be a good point. I mean, you always see those like race cars, you know, like you see some of these crazy people with like five, you know, monitors in front of them. And then every time they turn, it's rocking with them and shit. So, mm -hmm. you know, but then again, you're talking about Tom Cruise, my guy, you know, yeah. Tom Cruise don't play video <laughs> games. Tom Cruise is embracing reality. So, but then again, you know, Hey Tom, don't, don't be a hater. This might, this might actually be a good thing for you. I mean, after all, I mean, never mind. I'm not going to say what I was about to say, <laughs> but Henrik, uh, what's going on? I mean, this, this is kind of ruffling feathers in the industry. Talk to us. What's going on? Okay, so BlizzCon, which is uh, Blizzard Entertainment's big convention that they host in Anaheim, uh, and, and they haven't really been able to host it uh, in more recent years due to uh, you know the pandemic and restrictions around that and then just other things as well, I'm sure. But it's practically Christmas for fans of their, uh, their games like Diablo, Overwatch, World of Warcraft, and that's because they get to learn what they're working on in terms of with those games, if they have any new IPs they're working on, or if they have any sequels coming out, like a great moment of a BlizzCon was when Diablo Immortal, the mobile game was announced and everyone was like, where's Diablo 4? Like, we don't want a mobile <laughs> game. Uh, so people get really riled up about this clearly, but uh, you know, normally BlizzCon tickets, they sell out immediately like yeah, right away it's... within hours and this year it's a little bit different uh this year they're still available you can still go and buy a ticket in fact the resale tickets are going for less than the original price of the actual tickets which is wild that that just kind of shows what people are thinking of when they look at blizzard entertainment nowadays Two hundred to three hundred dollars a ticket. No offense to those who did buy them and are going, but WTF? Were they thinking? I'm actually shocked. I was certain they were still going to sell out despite all of Blizzard's failing, but I guess all the bad decisions really are starting to catch up to them. That's great news. I don't hold much hope left for this company, but if anything can make them change, it's losing a lot of money. There was a time when, had I been financially able, I would have jumped at a chance to go to blizzcon now i see this and my facial expression doesn't even change good job bobby at this point i can only hope blizzard stands as a warning to other game studios and publishers completely removing bobby from the company is the first step to redemption and last blizzcon may not sell out but you can bet your ass that blizzard will never stop selling out <laughs> <laughs> so people are clearly frustrated about that and i agree i mean like who in the hell is gonna pay 200 to 300 dollars to go to an event i'm sorry i could care a less talking to the developers or seeing them on a panel discussing that it's not like i'm seeing a triple a actor when you go to comic con and i'm not even getting a code to be able to acquire world of warcraft or overwatch or or even diablo 4 you would think that diablo 4 would come with the ticket if I'm going to be paying yeah, that I mean, much, they should give a game. I mean, to be fair, that's kind of the price that it has been uh, in previous years. You know, for reference, uh, for our viewers, 
the tickets for this year is $2.99 for the general admission and $7.99 for the VIP ticket, which includes everything that the general admission has. And then you have like a, a lounge you can go into, just some extra benefits, things like that. Ah, who cares, bro? That's Still like, right you know, there. when I was at the Five Point Amphitheater in Irvine, they're like, hey, you want to have your own specialized bar? I mean, dog, like, really? Like, you're going to pay an extra $60 yeah. for that silly feature? The beer is still going to cost the same. Still going to be 22 <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's just wild, though, that the tickets in previous years sold out, even though they were that expensive. But it just says that, all the fans who were willing to pay that have now turned their backs on Blizzard because of all the things that's going on with them between their harassment scandal and their yeah. games not being exciting to play anymore and just management issues. It just it's all compounding. And in more recent months, uh, not even years, just months, we've seen Blizzard take just a nosedive constantly. Like every Do you think month, that's there's because something coming of out. Microsoft acquiring. Blizzard? You know, I don't actually think that it's because of Microsoft. I think that if anything, Microsoft has the opportunity to switch things for Blizzard and turn them around into the direction that they're supposed to go into. But, you know, when I grew up, Blizzard was like the company that is is out there making games for the, the gamers themselves because they were gamers and they wanted to put out uh, games that were actually fun to play and good games at that and now it's just like it feels like the people who are in charge and i'm sure it is that the people in charge they don't actually play any games they don't play the games that they're making they don't test them themselves they're not going in and saying hey i'm not having fun playing diablo 4 we need to fix this because i want to be able to get off my shift at work go home play some diablo 4 and reap the benefits of what i've worked on do you think it's a lack of uh, new gaming IP as well? Probably part of that, yeah, because uh, they haven't come out with anything new since Overwatch was announced. That that was their most recent IP, and even that got mishandled completely in more recent years between uh, Overwatch just losing um, any updates and then Overwatch 2 coming out to some critical acclaim, but then also at the same time, terrible monetization and now yeah. everyone just doesn't play that game and, ha and has an overwhelmingly negative review on Steam. Yeah, I think that's a good point, because especially when you think about Blizzard Entertainment, it seems like the, the older generation of gamers are very keen on what they grew up with. And I mean, you can just read the forums on Reddit to Steam like they really give it to, you know, the new overseas uh, of this company because they want to see what they originally felt when they first embraced this studio company all those years. And yeah, I mean, I, I can see Activision getting the job done. I mean, they're just locked up in court. Give it some time. I mean, there's already um, suggested rumors that within the next couple of weeks, Activision will finally acquire Blizzard and then they can start getting ready to rock and roll. So we'll see what's good. But like uh, Henrik was saying, you know, it hasn't been sold out. They've been available since July 8th. Uh, you know, yeah, you get to hear about World of Warcraft updates. You get to watch the Overwatch 2 World Cup and whatever's next for Diablo 4. An expansion uh, yeah, I, mean, DLC. I, I guess if you're excited for that, then, you know, go ahead and tune in or go even, you know, see it in person. But I just think that the majority of people are probably not really excited for it. Clearly. Yeah, I, 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 I'm <laughs> with you on that one. I am a part of those group. <laughs> but hey, you know, BlizzCon tickets, if you want to go, they're still available. If, you, if, you, if you're willing to fork that money up, up front, baby. <laughs> yeah. But uh, what's going on with uh, Sony? I know we just talked about their uh, PlayStation Plus uh, just the other week. Yeah, like literally, I mean, I feel like Sony must have watched our live show, Rage Quit Video Game Talk Show, because we were literally discussing, like, what's better, PS Plus or the Xbox Game Pass, and I slightly gave the edge to Xbox Game Pass only because you get those day one releases, even though I'm a PlayStation guy, and yes, I have the PS Premium, but I'm still going to give it to the people straight. Well, PS Plus, you know, Sony, they must have been listening to us, because, uh, they got to change up real, real soon. You know, you got people like Microsoft, Amazon, Netflix gaming. When it comes to cloud gaming services, 
really kind of switching things up. I mean, I keep saying cloud gaming services, but really it's cloud subscriptions because everybody's got their niche. You think about Amazon. They control the whole globe, essentially, especially the United States when it comes to sending your shipment of goods, you know, through their, their website. Netflix obviously has their movies and television shows. You think about Microsoft and all the products that they got on their forefront, but to better incentivize PlayStation owners into subscribing to PS Plus Deluxe and pre or premium because if you get the normal ps plus sorry the same for you but sony announced that the certain subscription holders get access to a catalog of ad free movies along with 2000 movies that you're able to rent or buy and uh this is a move by sony that they're rebranding they've had this uh app for a while it was originally called Bravia Core, but they have recently renamed it Sony Pictures Core. So we're going to show you the only trailer that they got. They haven't had a revamped trailer yet, but we can at least show you an idea about what this app can bring to the gamers today. If you're a PS4 and you're a PS5 console owner, you can download it today. I just want to say I like how they had greatest film of 2022 in there, Morbius. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, to be fair, this was a this came out about like seven months ago. But yeah, I mean, even seven months ago, I think we would have figured out by now that that wasn't the greatest film of 2022. Oh man, yeah, that was uh, pretty lackluster of uh, Jared Leto. Sorry, fam, we don't mean to bash you on the show. It's it's just it's not you, fam. It was the storytelling. But hey, before we even chime into what Henrik the Wreck and I feel about this new feature, let's hear from the gamers online. The first comment that we got was playing video games with a decent storyline are my movies. I guess that's okay for some people. I think it's corny. I won't ever use it, laughing out loud. We have enough streaming services to watch movies and shows. They should just focus on gaming. Yay! Movies in a gaming subscription service. I don't know about everyone else, but I didn't buy a PS5 to watch movies. I mean, I can already do this in my smart TV slash phone. Xbox Game Pass is now cheaper per month than premium and gets games like Frozen Motorsports, Like a Dragon, Gaiden the Man, who erased his name, Persona 5 Tactica, Phoenix Wright, Ace Attorney Trilogy, like Dragon Ishin, Starfield, etc., etc. PS Premium gets a few old films. They have finally given me a reason to upgrade with the price hike. Okay, and last, this is what I've been waiting for. About time they added it to the PS Plus 2. So this news comes after a compelling time, considering how also Amazon Luna announced that gamers can purchase Ubisoft games from their cloud, which in turn, this is the crazy part, fam. Listen to this, because you can now buy Ubisoft game like Assassin's Creed Mirage on the Amazon Luna. You own that game license and what they are claiming because it got backed up and re-clarified with The Verge that you can bring that game license to another cloud service, let's say GeForce Now, and you own that game and you can play it wherever any kind of different cloud service. To me, that's trippy. I don't know how that's necessarily going to work out, but I want my boy Henrik the Wreck to come in and join the conversation. So first reaction, are you jiving with this? Do you feel like this is a necessary move? I mean, one of those commenters said it pretty well. You know, hey, finally, you got a reason to subscribe after the price hike, you yeah, know, because man. they did Oof. that price hike pretty recently, and it was a pretty substantial price hike at that. $40 so, hey, hike up. For yeah, at least the uh, premium, at least, 120 to 160 Exactly. So, I mean, maybe they had this plan already, but they kind of just didn't release the plan for this at the same time. But 
I, I do agree that the majority of people who probably have the subscription already are not really excited for movies because they probably already watch things on Netflix or some other streaming service. And this is just another place. I, I mean, I guess if you're paying for it, it's just another added benefit. Right. But it, it just feels like they're just throwing it in there because why not? You know, they have the rights to it. They have the ability to put it in there. Let's just throw it in there. There's one added benefit. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be discouraged, though. I mean, they're testing the waters. Um, some people might forget that, you know, Sony uh, acquired Crunchyroll, okay? Mm -hmm. And they're going to be bringing that to Sony Pictures Core app. And uh, they acquired that back in 2020 for almost $1.175 billion. So Sony is not really saying it. They're speaking out loud. They're, they're not speaking from the chest. They're speaking with their heart. They're letting you know we're coming after the anime world. We see that there is a correlation with gaming and anime, and they will eventually try to ruffle some feathers when it comes to, let's say, Netflix, who has a good amount of anime shows on there. Yes, they have some Netflix originals, but if they have Crunchyroll, and obviously they have the licensing agreement for a lot of those shows, they're going to start to swindle a lot of those favorite shows away from the Netflix user who was binging on their platform. And eventually you're going to have to join Sony. And that's the thing. And what I say, they're testing the model out is because you can't just download, you know, Sony pictures core right now on a smart TV. You have to be a PS4 or a PS5 owner and then download the app through the console. But eventually over time, this will be that service. And I think they have to come up with this niche because I, I still 110% embracing it. Cloud services are coming. It's more inevitable to this day. This is just another step to me that confirms this is the future. No more physical copies. No more physical consoles. Everything is going to be developed through a Sony PC monitor. It's going to be a smart TV. That's the future. So I don't know. Do you feel excited? I feel excited. I know some people worry about latency, but forget all that shit. If it worked well, wouldn't you be excited? I mean, I'm someone who buys my games, so, you know, I have to be convinced uh, that but, it's going to be I mean, a better... On, Are you honestly. really going to still be okay to pay 70 <laughs> plus games? I mean, it's not I like... I say that a lot of times I'm not paying $70 for a game, though. I'm usually getting a game on sale. I, like... But, I mean, you got the games, Xbox I'm Game Pass. Really, I'm really, really excited. Releases. I'm not going to pay $70 for it. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's absolutely crazy that they even do that, you know, but I mean, I, I see the lay of the land and I yes, I understand that, you know, certain, you know, like we were making fun of PS plus about with the price hikes and, you know, Xbox Game Pass, it's up there, too. But I think with when they add more of these additions on. I think it gives a little bit more of an incentive to kind of, you know, pick your battles and choose allegiance. So yeah, we'll, we'll see. I mean, about I mean, I I see them as kind of like they're doing the reverse of what Netflix is doing. Whereas like Netflix, they're known more as just the movie and television um, streaming service, but they're trying to get into gaming now. And then yeah. now inversely, uh, Sony is just known for this subscription, at least for gaming. And now they're trying to get into streaming movies and probably television series as well. And, you know, once they expand their catalog, they'll even get anime on there. It's just, it's or think be about music. I mean, Sony yeah, has music. a lot of artists that they sign, and yeah, yeah. they will most likely give us at one point going, "Hey, it was cool having Spotify and Apple Music. You can still have that on our platform, but you guys are already going to get free music with us." You know, and maybe it might be protected. Uh, what happens if you start doing video game streaming and, you know, and you're a, a Sony subscription? Maybe they might protect you and say, no, 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 that he subscribes to us. He's allowed to play that music. Because nowadays you see a lot of artists like Blink-182, they sold their complete music catalog. You know, you got Bruce Springsteen and et cetera, you know, doing their thing. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me. The artist got no control nowadays. I mean, when you see artists as young as Blink-182 just going, hey, forget it streaming they don't give us any money it's live touring and doing all the other things in life that is going to bring the value and that money to the band do you see that being a possibility or am i just wishing yeah, i mean yeah considering they have the rights to all these uh uh you know musicians already they might as well just have some way to host the service and uh deliver that to people who want to listen whether it be a Spotify competitor or, you know, just add it into this 
subscription that they're trying to grow, maybe have an app for it uh, like they do on the PS5 for other platforms, and then boom, there you go. You got an app for music, movies, television, uh, anime, and gaming yeah. all in one. Yeah, I mean, people won't fully embrace it until they actually leave the console and it be uh, accessible everywhere. But, you know, hey, you know, trying, trying to appease us, I guess. I'm still not happy about the price hike, though. But, hey, yeah. you know, that <laughs> essentially wraps things up with the Rage Quit Video Game Talk Show. And we can't thank you, the gamers, enough for joining us live every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And since you made it this far, you might as well hit the like and subscribe button and the notification bell so you never miss a live show and Hendrik the Rex always got amazing content all over his YouTube channel TikTok you name it so let the people know what's good where can they follow you my man yeah they can follow me on YouTube TikTok Twitter and Instagram and uh, on all those platforms every Friday I post either a game to play or an in development soapbox this week is an in development soapbox which is my chance to go look at a game that's in development not fully released, and just tell you about it and see, hey, this game's awesome. Go take a look at it. That's right, baby. Hey, and I also want to encourage you guys, if you want to check out uh, endless content of interviews that I've done over the four years span, join the com. You'll have music, gaming, entertainment, pop culture, TV and film, a little bit of politics here and there. You name it, we got it. Go ahead and check it out. I'd love to have you guys' the support. But for now, Henrik the Wreck and I, we will see you next week, fam. Peace. See ya.